Good evening, everyone. I am Tan Sien Li from the Center for International Law and the NUS Law Faculty. It is very good to see so many of you here. Happy New Year, happy Dragon Year. It is my very, very great pleasure to welcome all of you to this distinguished lecture co-hosted by the Center for International Law and the European Journal of International Law. This lecture is given by Professor Tony Angi, whom we all know as a preeminent jurist of international law. Professor Tony Angi is also a great mentor to many of us in this room. And among other things, his professional accolades include him being a member of the Institute of International Law, and last year he was the 2023 awardee of the Manley or Hudson Medal, the highest recognition of the American uh, Society of International Law. And of course, most of all, he's known as one of the founding fathers of the Third World Approaches to International Law, or commonly known as TWAIL, the arguments of which resonate in the contemporary debates between the North and South and in the decolonization discourse of today. At CIL, at, at the Center for International Law, Tony runs the training and research of international law in Asia, and he has covered many countries, and in this year, moving forward, uh, he will be conducting Trila in Laos. Last year, he did it in Kazakhstan. So he is uh, expanding the pluralization discourse to across Asia. Um, Tony will talk about how international law began in Singapore, but before Tony begins, I would like to invite the co-editor-in-chief of uh, the European Journal of International Law, Professor Joseph Weiler, to address all of you. Joseph. Thank you very much, and Happy New Year, and it's a privilege and an honor to be here. If you were to ask an American academic, no, I should say, if you were to ask an honest American academic, in which journal would you most like to publish, she or he would say the Harvard Law Review. That's the cake. If you wanted to give them the cherry on the cake, they would say, I don't only want to publish in the Harvard Law Review, I want to be invited to give the forward, the annual forward to the Harvard Law Review, an institution that was started many years ago, which in theory is meant to be a statement on the previous term of the Supreme Court, but it never is. It's an invitation to a prominent scholar to make a major statement about the field. And that's Everybody looks at it, everybody reads it. It's really a, a landmark in the career of an American academic. EGIL is much younger than the Harvard Law Review, and sometimes you say that imitation is the best form of flattery. So we decided a few years ago, if the Harvard Law Review can have a forward, now I'm gonna boast, since every international lawyer every honest international lawyer. If you ask them where would you like to publish, they would say the European Journal of International Law. They might say also the American Journal. So we decided also to introduce a forward and to invite, it's by invitation, to invite scholars to write a forward which would be a major statement of the field. Some years ago, we decided to invite Tony Angi before he got the medal before all those accolades, so we weren't just joining a bandwagon. And we did this for two reasons. First of all, because of his personal qualities. He really is, in anybody's list, in the top five or six most interesting and important scholars of international law. But in addition, and it goes together, because we thought that TWAIL, Third World Approaches to International Law, merits a major statement in the foreword to EGIL. And I must say, I was going to say, but I'm not allowed to say, it's the best foreword we've had, but I didn't say that. 
but we were very, very pleased with the result, and so pleased with the result that we decided we are now going to have an annual forward lecture uh, to give even greater prominence to the Egil Forward. So it's a great pleasure and an honor and a privilege to be here seated next to Tony Angie giving the first annual EGIL Forward Lecture. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> well, um, thank you so much, uh, Sandy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joseph, for those very kind words. I think all of you have heard the expression, quit while you are ahead. And that is very much what I feel like doing right now, uh, given all the very kind things that have been said about me and this particular forward. But uh, all of you are here, thank you for coming. And uh, so I will actually address some comments on this topic of third world approaches to international law. Uh, let me simply say that uh, I'm deeply grateful for the honor that uh, the European General bestowed upon me by inviting me to write this forward. Uh, it is something I didn't really expect because, um, as I will explain, third world approaches to international law is seen as a somewhat marginal, eccentric uh, sort of uh, voice in international law, or that is the way in which it has been seen. Uh, something of interest, but a curiosity rather than a serious contribution to the discipline. Um, so, um, it was a real uh, honor to be, uh, 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 to be uh, invited uh, to the European Journal of International Law because, of course, we who are scholars of TWAIL feel that it is actually a very important approach to international law and a badly needed approach to international law. That is what we think, but for that to be recognized is very significant. Uh, let me uh, also thank uh, the uh, different um, uh, members of the European Journal of International Law uh, for all the assistance they gave me here uh, in writing this forward. And I really do want to mention uh, Sarah uh, Nowen, Annie Bremner, who was extraordinarily patient, um, um, and, um, and Joseph uh, for a very astute application of sticks and carrots. He would give me deadlines and then I would be frantically trying to meet those deadlines. I would fail, I'd get an extension, but at least something was done. And so this was the way in which uh, the whole process unfolded. Joseph and I agree very much on one principle, which is that good scholarship takes time. And he gave me the time to do what I hope uh, is good scholarship. So it is in all, the, all those uh, respects uh, that I would like to thank the European Journal and I would like to thank my colleagues at the Center for International Law for all the assistance they have given me, uh, particularly Jerry and Emil. Okay, let's get all that out of the way. So um, um, let me begin uh, by saying I'm faced with a particular uh, dilemma here, which is uh, how do I make this topic interesting to all of you here based in Singapore? If I was giving this lecture in Sri Lanka, I would give a different type of lecture because what I'd like to do is to try and connect the location of the audience, the location of this particular lecture, with the theme. And uh, so uh, that is why I'm trying to make a claim about, a, ra a rather large claim, that international law began in Singapore. Uh, the second thing is that this uh, foreword is about 100 pages long. And so um, I'm not in a position, or I don't think it is wise for me to simply try to summarize the uh, forward. Uh, I think that would be mechanical um, and uh, not particularly interesting. So what I'm trying to achieve here is to use Singapore as a way of providing a glimpse of some of the key themes and concerns of TWAIL. And then, having been exposed to that glimpse, uh, you could yourselves decide whether you want to pursue uh, this topic further. So those are some preliminary comments. Uh, so let me begin with um, some basic themes or concerns of third world approaches to international law. Now the first question we could ask is, what is the third world anyway? And here, let me just say a few things. Uh, so the term third world uh, was uh, 
originated by a French scholar who divided the world into three sections. He said, there is the first world, which consists of the industrialized rich North. The second world consists of the socialist countries. Now, uh, this terminology was developed in the 1950s. We have to keep that in mind. And the third world were the poorest countries in the world, and generally these were the countries that had been colonized. So it is in that context that we could see the word or the term third world signifying on one hand a geographical location because it is principally in the south, in the southern hemisphere that these countries, the poorer countries are located. So it is a geographical term. It is also a political term in the sense that it refers to the countries that had been colonized over the many centuries um, uh, uh, leading up to the 1940s um, when decolonization began in, er in earnest. So it is a political term. It is also perhaps uh, what I would call um, a discursive term, and that is a rather large, uh, perhaps, uh, concept. But what I mean here is that there is a particular structure of ideas that has been used to deal with this phenomenon called the third world. So as the term itself suggests, it is inferior. And this inferiority is suggested, or it is, or it is poverty stricken, or it is um, in need of improvement and development. And so my claim is that if we look at the history of international law, this term, in a way, is a successor uh, to various other ways in which the non-European world has been described. And I will come back to that issue uh, later. And finally, perhaps, uh, I would say the term third world is a metaphor. It is a metaphor representing those peoples or speaking of those peoples who are most marginalized and most disadvantaged. And so the, the term third world has all these different connotations. And I would say uh, right from the outset that this term uh, is in many respects a problematic term, but I want to present at least some of the basic features of this ter term so we have something to work with as it were. So the first uh, concern of Twale scholars, I belong to a network of scholars um, uh, that have uh, adopted this approach, or tried to develop this approach, are the inheritors of this approach. And the first issue uh, that I would point to if we ask to identify the core themes of Twale is how can the peoples of the third world use international law to further their own interests? Now this is a complicated question because as, sh as I shall try and argue, international law was developed in order to actually suppress the peoples of the third world to justify their colonization, to justify the extraction of their resources. So there's this complex issue of how can we use a law to further our own interests in a situation where that law had been the mechanism, the technology of our own suppression. And so that connects to the second theme, which is my argument is that imperialism is central to the formation of international law. Now, this departs very significantly from the conventional history and theory of international law. Because in the conventional history and theory of international law, colonialism is a side event. The conventional history would say all the major developments that we need to understand in order to appreciate how international law developed, all those events took place in Europe. And here, uh, I would make a further claim that we have to understand the way in which the history of international law has been written. And again, I'm uh, making these statements in a rather, you could say, um, a terse way. But let me just put it this way. I would say that the question is whose history matters? And history matters because it is particular events ge that generate the theory that then becomes the, the major framework by which scholars and practi practitioners view the world. And the transformation from a historical event, a specific historical event, into theory is 
in a way, an extraordinary feature because then a specific provincial event becomes of universal significance. Because rather than think of that event as being specific to a particular place and particular to that particular place, the rules, the ideas that are supposed to emerge from that event assume the form of theory. And when it reforms, assumes the form of theory, it is of universal significance. And so my argument here is that it is the events of Europe that have created the theory of international law that has governed the way in which we international lawyers have viewed the discipline. And I'll elaborate on that point as well. I keep making these promises. Uh, okay, uh, please don't hold me to them. I, I'm, I've got a lot to cover, but I hope uh, to uh, at least pr present each step um, in a somewhat systematic way. Then let me uh, f focus on another feature of third world approaches to international law. This is what I co we call, uh, uh, my colleagues and I, focus on the lived experience of the peoples of the third world as an approach to international law. Now this sounds very dubious and uh, you know, vague. What does it mean to talk about the lived experience of the peoples of the third world? So here again, what I'm trying to suggest is we need to think of a different epistemology, a different source of understanding of international law. So a classic way of understanding international law is to think about the great conferences which have created the institutions of international law, the structures of international law, the major doctrines of international law. We can think of uh, for example, all the negotiations that went to the creation of the League of Nations, or the negotiations that took place in relation to the creation of the United Nations, or more recently, the Uruguay round of negotiations that resulted in the creation of the WTO, or the BBNJ, to focus on something much more recent. That would be one way of understanding international law, and it is a fairly conventional way of understanding international law. When I talk about the lived experience of peoples of the third world, we try to focus on a different reality. We would like to focus, for instance, on a situation of a person living, a woman living in the third world who needs medicines. And those medicines are not readily available. And the reasons that those medicines are not readily available are because of a whole structure of legal regimes which might in the end be traced up to the WTO and the TRIPS agreement. So it is in that context that we're trying to say, let's try and look at international law from the bottom up, from the ground up. Let's try and look at the way in which international law affects the lives of all of us. And I would claim international law does affect the lives of all of us not in ways that are always easily recognized, for example. But when countries suffer from a shortage of medi medicines or a shortage of vaccinations, the reasons for that shortage might have something to do with the way in which international law is structured. So rather than study the WTO in terms of all the negotiations that led to the TRIPS agreement, we might study this whole phenomenon by saying, why is it that some people have access to medications and others do not? and is the lived experience in that respect of the peoples of the third world that offer us a clue. Because after all, we should assess the validity of international law in terms of how it affects the lives of people and whether it enables them to lead good lives. Now, this is not an easy task to undertake. But all I can say here is that it is the goal to say this is the prism that we should be considering when trying to assess international law and understand how it works and whether it benefits people or not. And the same could be said of environmental law, <laughs> uh, since I can see uh, my, my co environmental law colleague here uh, in that regard. You know, what is it that people in the, small, in, in the small island states in the Pacific are experiencing? You know, they are in danger of losing their land completely. And somehow that experience, that very visceral experience of loss is connected with a whole structure, a whole assembly of legal regimes. And they end up in negotiations at the COP <laughs> or perhaps at ITLOS, you know, different uh, venues for all these issues. Okay, uh, and um, so it's in that context that uh, we talk about decolonization. In other words, <clears throat> 
rather than use a vocabulary that has been developed based on Western experience, which presents itself as theory, as being the authoritative vocabulary by which to describe the reality of people in the third world. How do we find the language in order to express these other realities, the realities of the people who have been colonized rather than the people who were the colonizers, because it was the colonizers who made international law. So it is this struggle to find a different vocabulary which is truer to the experiences of people in the third world. And again, all this sounds romantic and abstract, but I hope I can provide it with content as I proceed. Or perhaps I should say, please read my foreword. <laughs> you know, that tries to provide uh, content in that context. So that is what we mean by decolonization, the development of an alternative vocabulary. What are the suppressed forms of knowledge that we have to think about? And when I mentioned the lived experience of peoples of the third world, I don't see those people as simply being passive, as being victims of international law. I also see those people as sources of knowledge. They, they might have different ways of understanding the world, a different way, for example, of understanding the human interaction with the environment, for instance. <laughs> There's a whole story here about property and the environment and how by adopting one concept of property, we've changed the course of world history. But if there was a different concept of property, it would be a different type of society. And certainly in the case of indigenous peoples and so forth, there are indications of a different approach to the environment. That is something that we can learn from and that we should try to deal with. And so it is trying to understand this alternative history that we need to think about different concepts. And so race here becomes really important because race was the way in which the international lawyers of the 19th century divided the civilized European world from the uncivilized non-European world. Race was constitutive in this way of international law, decisive in international law. And the question is trying to understand the operation of race in the making of international law and perhaps in its subsequent operations as well. And then uh, another concept we might use is the concept of the civilizing mission. In other words, the basic idea is these people are uncivilized. And there's a legal issue here. How is it decided that they are uncivilized? What is the legal technology, the legal standards that are used to deem a people uncivilized? Who creates those standards? So we can see the operation of law even in that initial move, designating the uncivilized. And then once they are uncivilized, they no, no longer have full personality. And because they don't have full personality in the world of international law, what this means is that they are not equally sovereign. They are sovereign perhaps, but in an inferior, in inferior way. They don't have all the rights of European sovereigns. This was clearly the case in the 19th century that European sovereigns, in a way, embodied sovereignty in its fullest proper form. And Asian sovereigns were kind of sovereign, but in a very qualified and complicated way. And so this is, uh, these are some of the themes uh, presented to you in a somewhat higgledy-piggledy fashion um, that concern uh, third world approaches to international law scholars. And I should also emphasize that this is only my own take on Twail because my colleagues have written uh, superb, outstanding articles about Twail and I try to refer to them in my foreword because there are a number of different versions of what this movement constitutes of and what our concerns are. And I thought I would begin by just uh, <clears throat> pointing to two scholars who embodied all the traditions and qualities that I mentioned and there could be many more. So one is Professor Api Anand, the great Indian international law scholar who uh, you know, spent his career in India and who really tried to develop an alternative vocabulary, a different way of understanding international law by focusing on the needs of developing countries and saying this is important. We need to address these concerns. We need to develop the doctrines that would in some way further the interests of these peoples, these communities. The second person uh, 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 here is uh, Professor Eric Williams, 
Um, I'm not sure whether any of you might have heard of Eric Williams. Uh, he is a great scholar from Trinidad, and I mention his work, I discuss his work in the foreword. Why is he significant? He is significant because living in the West Indies, you could say the lived experience of living in the West Indies, led him to study the whole history of slavery. But his understanding of the history of slavery was very different from the history of slavery that had been conventionally presented. And so it was a struggle for him when he went to Oxford <laughs> you know, to try and say, actually, there is a different approach to slavery. And here he's making a strong argument. He is saying slavery was abolished not out of humanitarian sentiment, but because of economic reasons. It was no longer as profitable as it used to be. He connected slavery with capitalism and the ebbs and flows of capitalism. And as you can see, this is a radically different understanding of slavery and the abolition of slavery. And it wasn't easy for him to get his work published because it was uh, such a departure. And so we do admire the pioneering quality of what he has done. And he also points to another alternative vision of capitalism itself, because one understanding of capitalism is it was a creation of the industry, the innovation, the rationality of the North. The Industrial Revolution was a creation of all these virtuous qualities which the West possessed and which somehow Asia failed to um, develop at quite the same pace. But Eric Williams's point is actually one of the reasons for the success of capitalism was slavery. It's not quite such a happy story of capitalism as one that is told in terms of industry and innovation and so forth. So those are just some preliminary comments uh, about twelve. Let me now go try and give some content to uh, what I've been talking about. Now, the classic history of international law begins with this event. If I was in class, I would ask people, have uh, any of you familiar with this portrait? We can't see it particularly well because it's a bit, um, because of the exposure. But uh, this is uh, a great, a famous picture which adorns the covers of many international law books. It is a picture of the a, a Treaty of Westphalia, or one of the two treaties uh, which constitute the Peace of Westphalia. And for conventional histories of international law, this is the decisive moment. International law began with the Peace of Westphalia because this was the moment where the sovereign state was created. The sovereign state was created in many respects as a response to the challenge of religious warfare. So with the creation of the sovereign state, we had, in very simple terms, an understanding that a sovereign state can adopt its own religion. Each sovereign state can adopt the system of government that it thinks appropriate. And it should be allowed as an attribute of its sovereignty to adopt its own government. It could not be attacked simply because it adopted a form of religion which some might regard as heretic. And with this moment, we have also a construction of the major problem of international law as it is understood in uh, conventional histories. The major problem of international law is that there is no enforcement because here we have a situation of equal and sovereign states, that is what emerges from Westphalia, and in those circumstances, equal and sovereign states, the great issue is how can order be created among equal and sovereign states in the absence of an overarching sovereign. So this is the moment, and of course Westphalia is in uh, modern day Germany, I believe. So this, again, is my um, illustration of my argument, which is that particular moments give rise to theory. And it is the piece of Westphalia that has constructed the great theoretical paradigms that all the great international law scholars feel almost like Everest or almost like a major mathematical problem that was created in 1524 or something like that. We have to solve this problem or demonstrate an answer to this issue of how can order be created among equal and sovereign states. Let's move to a different location. <clears throat> I like this map of this region, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, extending up to the Middle East, because I believe it is an Arabic map. <laughs> it suggests the world as it was viewed 
by the peoples of Southeast Asia and the Middle East, um, their vision of the world, you know, before the arrival uh, perhaps of the Europeans. And we do note that before the arrival of um, the Europeans, there were complex trading networks, there were very rich societies and empires, in fact, that were in place in this region. And so we might mention here um, Majapahit or, uh, uh, um, or Sri Vijaya, major trading empires in this region. Now what is interesting to me, though, is that as international lawyers anyway, we don't really have a sense about what doctrines, what principles were used to manage relations of trade and create all this great wealth. So in the, mo in the modern world, as it were, we are familiar uh, with techniques of ha handling risk through things like letters of credit. How was risk managed in the context of these great trading empires? That is a source of knowledge that I think could be of more than just historical value in terms of dealing with these issues. But now I deal, my next slide will uh, focus us on an event which took place in 1603. And this event took place off the coast of Singapore. And this event was the capture of a large Portuguese vessel, a treasure ship, because it contained within it all the riches of the East, of China and Southeast Asia the ceramics and uh, everything else that was greatly valued in Europe at the time. And it is said um, that the value of the treasure was a, the equivalent of the revenue of England in the year 1603. So it was, it was quite a considerable treasure in 1603. And this Portuguese vessel was captured by these six smaller Dutch vessels. And the smaller Dutch vessels took the treasure. And this caused a major dispute in Europe, a Europe that was still reeling in the midst of different wars that were taking place. And in, as part of that dispute, uh, the whole question arose of the legality of the Dutch capture of this treasure. Now, as far as the Portuguese were concerned, the answer was extremely clear. The Dutch were simply pirates, among the worst of all the species of wrongdoers in the world of international law. And this was a flagrantly illegal act. It was simply an act of piracy. Now, what is interesting about um, the Portuguese entity that inherited this, this treasure is that it is an entity which had its own coat of arms, its own identity, and uh, it is an entity that we know as the Dutch East India Company. And so it was the Dutch East India Company that was defending the capture of this treasure um, in 1603. And the Dutch East India Company was a, re a remarkable institution. If we have a look at the trading routes that the Dutch East India Company uh, established, we can see that these trading routes are really global in scope, uh, encompassing North America, all the way from North America to New Holland, Australia. It was Dutch vessels that really explored Australia and New Zealand. Abel Tasman, for instance, for those of you who are from Australia. And it was a, an extraordinary system of trading networks. Um, and it was also supported by brilliant financing and new techniques and methods of financing and new corporate forms that enabled this institution to flourish to an extraordinary uh, extent. I believe that the first uh, stock exchange was created in Amsterdam. And the reason for the creation of that stock exchange was to enable trading in the shares of the Dutch East India Company. So this was an extraordinary entity. And uh, I found myself, to my surprise, once in North America, in a place called, a small town in North America on the border of Canada, and the name of that town was Batavia. And I thought to myself, Batavia? What am I doing in Batavia, here, here in upstate New York? 
Because of course, Batavia is the name the Dutch gave to Jakarta. So there's a Batavia in Jakarta, there's a Batavia in upstate New York. And it is all because of the explorations of the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company that was created subsequently. In terms of the power of this entity, now this is, uh, uh, this is a chart which is maybe about 10 years old, uh, but it's from Forbes magazine, and it gives us a pretty clear idea of the power of the Dutch East India Company. Now, Apple's value is now more than $1 trillion, uh, but still, in comparison, you can see the Dutch East India Company was perhaps the most valuable company that ever existed. I'm not sure where Aramco fits into this, but anyway, the Dutch East Indian Company was an extraordinary, extraordinarily wealthy and powerful entity. And it was crucial to the creation of what was called the Dutch Golden Age. Uh, oh, actually, Saudi Aramco is mentioned there, actually. So the Dutch East Indian Company at its very height was worth more than, the, than Aramco, although no doubt Aramco itself has actually increased in value. So you can see the Dutch East India Company was this extraordinary entity, and it had to defend its position in relation to the capture of the Portuguese vessel. And so the question is, who do we hire? Who are the legal experts we can employ to provide us with a legal opinion, with an expert op opinion, which would hopefully conclude that what the Dutch did was completely legal? And so the East India Company approached a young lawyer who at that time already had a reputation for being precocious and utterly brilliant. And of course that lawyer was Grotius. And Grotius of course is conventionally understood as being perhaps the father of international law. The Grotius Lecture is usually the term given to multiple lectures taking place all over Europe, which focus on international law. He is the great figure of international law. But this Grotius is a somewhat junior Grotius. And what he does is he writes, well, he's given this assignment by the East India Company, by the Dutch East India Company, and he finds this topic of such interest that he writes a work that is more than 300 pages long. I don't know whether it all counted as billable hours, but you can see that he was interested as a scholar in this issue as much as he was as a practicing lawyer. But the shorter work he produced was a work that we now know as the Free Sea. The longer work is a work called The Law of Prize and Booty. What were the arguments that Grotius made? So here, his basic argument, uh, his first principle, well, um, uh, somewhat, I am um, simplifying somewhat, is access to all nations is open to all, not merely by the permission, but by the command of the law of nations. And neither the sea itself nor the right of navigation thereon can become the exclusive possession of a particular party, whether through seizure, through a papal grant, or through prescription, that is to say, custom. His basic argument, in other words, is that there is a right to trade. This is a fundamental absolute right. And his basic argument is that the Portuguese were violating this fundamental natural right, the right to trade, because the Portuguese were trying to exclude the Dutch from trading in Asia. And among the, uh, among the um, uh, arguments made by the Portuguese was the argument that they owned the sea, as it were, because they were the first to find the route from Europe to Asia, Vasco da Gama. So Grotius refuted this, and he said Port the Portuguese have violated this fundamental principle. And in making this argument, he relied on an earlier scholar whose name is Francisco de Vitoria. And Victoria said, it was permissible from the beginning of the world, when everything was in common, for anyone to set forth and travel wheresoever he would. There was an absolute right to travel. There was an absolute right to trade. And all that was seen as fundamental to the most essential right, which is the right of self-preservation. And that is a point that Grotius makes as well. So, we can see that the argument is 
the, the Portuguese have violated this right. So we are entitled, therefore, to take action against the Portuguese. Now the complication here is that the act that is in question is an act of war. And under international law, the entity which has the monopoly on the whole issue, the prerogative go to go to war is the sovereign state. But in this case, it was the Dutch vessels that went to war, unauthorized by the Dutch government. And the Dutch government itself was still emerging, uh, you could say, uh, because it was involved in its own conflicts with Spain and so forth. So Grotius made another brilliant argument. And this is an argument having to do with private war, because a corporation is a private actor. And so here he says, the examples afforded by all living creatures show that force privately exercised privately exercised for the defense and safeguarding of one's own body is justly employed. Furthermore, such force is also just when the purpose is defense or recovery of one's property. Nor is it less so when employed for the collection of debt. A very interesting range of issues, isn't it? A very interesting range of principles. In other words, you could go to war for economic reasons because a debt has not been paid. And you can go to war in order to recover property. His argument here is that in normal circumstances, it is only a sovereign that can go to war. But the world beyond Europe is a world of the state of nature. It is a world that is not regulated by the civilized principles that operate in Europe. And besides, the Dutch government is not in a position to protect the rights of its distant, this distant entity out in the South, uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. And so, the basic argument is, in a state of nature, every entity has a right of self-preservation. Every entity has a right of self-defense. And therefore, the corporation has a right of self-defense. And we see the different, you could say, uh, 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 steps in this uh, uh, reasoning. So that is Grotius's argument. And his argument is a corporation can go to war to preserve its own interests in a situation where the, uh, the setting is the state of nature. Now, this is the later Grotius. The Grotius, who is the author of the great work, The Rights of War and Peace. But here, I would argue that it is the earlier Grotius who really, in many respects, articulated the basic principles of international law in that earlier work. And it is that earlier work that has shaped the rights of war and peace. So it is in that respect that I think that it could be claimed that if we see Grotius as the central figure in the making of international law, international law began in Singapore. Um, and it's interesting to see the portrait of Grotius. On the right, we see the classic portrait of the earlier Grotius. But I think it's also telling that in this edition of the Rights of War and Peace, we see a portrait of the <coughs> younger Grotius, the Grotius who wrote the free sea. And that is a kind of hint, perhaps, that it is the free sea that is the defining work that he later built on. OK, now, Grotius scholars have big debates about this, so I'm not making a big claim here. I'm just presenting this as a possibility. Um, but I also want to point to another major issue that we should focus on here. When Grotius was writing the free sea, he was not trying to justify the rights of a sovereign state. He was trying to justify the actions of a corporation. So it's fascinating to think then that perhaps we might even <coughs> extravagantly make a claim that the theorizing about international law began in terms of the rights of a corporation. This was, after all, before 
the Peace of Westphalia. Would that change our understanding of international law if we saw that as being the major paradigm by which to think about international law? So, yes, we might say that international law began here with the Peace of Westphalia. I go back to the original drawing. But we might also say that international law began here. And this is, this is Changi. So um, several Singaporean scholars have made this point. You know, and uh, my friend Kevin Tan was the person who really pointed me in this direction, um, uh, Dr. Kevin Tan. And uh, Dr. Navin Rajagopal has also looked at this issue. And here in Singapore, uh, there is a brilliant scholar who has done extensive work on this whole Singapore connection. And that is uh, Peter Boschberg, who I think is an extraordinary scholar, and we're fortunate to have him here in Singapore. So uh, this is, well, actually, it's got nothing to do with the, the presentation, but it's just a beautiful picture. Um, and it is a picture by Vermeer, the view from Delft. And I just thought I'll include that as a sort of interlude, as it were. Um, now, the question is, for Twale scholars, we can see Grotius's theorizing as being a step in the construction of one particular way of furthering colonialism. And this is through economic domination. And the question is, what are the technologies, what are the techniques of economic domination that were used in the colonial enterprise? What were the legal doctrines? What were the ways in which personality was uh, demarcated? All those different points. So I think what I would uh, hear, what I think one of the lasting legacies of Grotius is this triangle. <laughs> because Grotius compares the corporation on one hand to an individual human being. In other words, all individuals, all persons have a right of self-defense in a state of nature. And he says, well, the corporation com could be compared to a human being because a corporation is a collection, is a collection of human persons. On the other hand, the corporation is sovereign because it is a sovereign that in those circumstances can go to war. And so the corporation has this brilliantly fluid character. It can be a person or it can be a sovereign. And sometimes the corporation is neither of those things. It simply disappears even while it continues to exercise a huge influence on the making of international law. Now, the point I would make here is this is actually the foreign investment system. That might require a bit of elaboration, but um, let me simply say that if we look at the, foreign, the, the current system of ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, we can see the, we can see the, the corporation as being like the individual investor. The corporation is a person. And yet, when it gets to the investment system itself, the corporation is an equal sovereign. It is the corporation that is able to sue states, sovereign states, using international law. So can we see that even in that structure of the investor state dispute settlement system, we have a corporation, in a sense, employing that dual character. And if we look at the history of the development of that system, it has that dual character. The other thing to notice here simply is that a human person can be held responsible under international law. That is what international criminal law is about. To, to uh, try individuals who have uh, uh, committed heinous crimes, international crimes, the individual can be held responsible under international law. That is what the ICC is about. The sovereign can be held responsible under international law. That is what state responsibility is about. But as yet, we don't have an effective system to hold the corporation responsible for violations of international law. That's a rather large claim, but I'll just leave it out there. So all I'm trying to say here now is that if we want to understand the history of Asia in terms of this whole phenomenon of colonialism, we can't focus on equal and sovereign states. 
So for example, if we take this treaty, and treaties were a very important way in which imperial relations were furthered. So this is the Treaty of Friendship and Alliance, 1819. This is the Treaty of Singapore. And what is interesting here is that is a treaty made by the Honorable Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles, but he is acting on behalf of the Honorable English East India Company. So here there is a reference to uh, the governor of Fort Marlborough and its dependencies. There's a sort of reference to a distant sovereign, but it is the East India Company that is driving the whole process. And um, you know, it'll be we we don't have time to do this, but it's fascinating to to, see, to analyze the Treaty of 1819 and then the Treaty of Seizure of 1821, which is a situation in which the corporation simply becomes sovereign in effect over Singapore, and the Sultan of Johor and his um, successors are bound by that treaty. And we might also think of another famous treaty, and this was a treaty that. Uh, emerged as a result of the Opium War. And again, in the course of the Opium War, the basic argument was that China was violating the right to trade in trying to prohibit opium. That was a vi violation of the right to trade. And the violation of the right to trade gives right to reprisals, and that includes war. And so if you look at the Treaty of Nanjing, it was the operations of a corporation that led to that war and to all the complex political and economic circumstances that followed as a result of the Treaty of Nanjing. Um, and uh, there's a mention here of Her Majesty the Queen, but it's also interesting that her, the representative in that treaty is a, it's a uh, Charles Pottinger, representative of the East India Company. We, we might also notice the language. Um, there shall henceforth be peace and friendship between Her Majesty the Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and His Majesty the Emperor of China and between their respective subjects who shall enjoy full security and protection for their persons and property within the dominions of the other. So that's Article 1 of the Treaty of Nanjing. Again, a fascinating treaty to, to study. But we might also notice the term full security and protection. Does that resonate with anybody? That is a standard term in investment treaties, although the term itself changes in the sequence. It is full protection and, so, and security rather than full security and protection. So this is why Twale scholars feel that it is important to understand the historical antecedents of the principles that are still in operation today and which have great significance if we look at current investor state arbitrations and the decisions that are made which interpret this treaty. Does it help us to say this is actually this treaty, this provision has, has early antecedents and those antecedents have an intimate connection with colonialism itself. So one of the claims that Twale also makes is that colonialism is not a thing of the past. That colonial re relations are reproduced but in a language, a terminology that appears to be neutral. And one of the tasks that Twale scholars engage in is to try and demonstrate that a term which appears neutral is not in fact neutral, not only because of its effects in creating inequalities, but because those, the term itself was forged in a situation where colonialism was the experience which led to that particular principle or even terminology becoming a part of international law. And so that is why I would cite this example in terms of full security and protection or full protection and security. Okay, now colonialism was furthered through economic mechanisms. Goodness, it is six o'clock. I have to stop. <laughs> you know. Um, right. Um, Okay, uh, let me just talk a little bit about war, <laughs> a large topic. Um, the other aspect of, uh, of Grotius was the argument of war. And for Grotius, it is not just war, it is self-defense. The Dutch 
are engaged in self-defense against the Portuguese. And there's extensive writing about war. And Francisco Vitoria, for example, says, the Vitoria I cited earlier, first in the just war, one may do everything necessary for the defense of the public good. The basic question is, are there any limits to self-defense? And Vitoria says, in the just war, as long as the war is just, so the interesting question is, what is a just war? Who decides that it is just? One may do everything necessary for the defense of the public good. Now, a further aspect of, uh, you could say, the development of international law is, as I've already suggested, there were two international laws. One international law that applied among civilized countries and another international law that applied when civilized countries had to deal with uncivilized countries. And when civilized countries had to deal with uncivilized countries or uncivilized communities, a different set of rules had to operate. So Victoria says, for example, since our war against the pagans, so this is the uncivilized, the pagans, is of this kind being permanent. The war against the pagans is permanent because they can never sufficiently pay for the injuries and loss inflicted, it is not to be doubted that we may lawfully enslave the women and children of the Saracens. So the basic argument is the enslavement of women and children of a Christian nation would be prohibited. But here we are dealing with pagans. It is a different type of community. And um, so uh, uh, here we uh, encounter, you could say, the structure of a colonial war and is invariably presented as a war of self-defense. We are defending ourselves against these savages, and these savages do not adhere to the laws of war, and therefore we can take extraordinary measures against these savages. And so, for example, he says, sometimes security cannot be obtained without the wholesale destruction of the enemy. This is particularly the case in wars against the infidel, from whom peace can never be hoped for on any terms. Therefore, the only remedy is to eliminate all of them who are capable of bearing arms against us, given they are already guilty, given they are already guilty. So it is a rather extensive language of justifying violence in all these different ways. And um, here's an article which um, was written in the 19th century when th things became a little more extreme. I, I also want to make clear that Victoria was a very complex figure. He was a very brave figure, and he struggled with these, these many different versions of law and how to deal with the situation. And one thing that I came across uh, when reading, rereading his work this time, which I hadn't come across or really noted before, is when he says, it is never right to commit evil, even to avoid greater evils. Interesting proposition, isn't it? So, um, by the time of the 19th century, colonial wars took on an extraordinary character. They were pretty much wars of extermination. And uh, this article, if you're interested in reading it, uh, gives us a sense of um, you know, uh, the extent of the violence that might be used in these types of circumstances. And the title of the article itself is very telling, How to Make War on Savage Tribes. And his argument is a different type of war is needed in those types of circumstances. So we can see, you could see the economic dimension of colonialism, and we might also see the dimension of colonialism that focuses on war. And here, trail scholars focused, for instance, on the US war on terror. And in the US war on terror, we see circumstances following the terrorist attacks of 9-11, a situation where the United States said, we are at war, we have to engage in self-defense. And the extent of self-defense was extraordinary because it involved going to war against uh, Afghanistan, going to war against Iraq. But that was presented as necessary in order to ensure ongoing safety. So here we have a situation where Taking over these lands is essential for security. And the whole global war on terror, I think, is still recovering from what had happened. But new ideas of self-defense were articulated to justify the extension of violence. Because, for example, Iraq had not attacked the United States. And yet, it was the object 
of the war being conducted by the United States. Okay, I've been talking a lot about Grotius and Western scholars, and so then the question becomes, what about the third world? What about the scholars, uh, the initiatives being taken by Asia and Africa? And here for Twelve scholars, the Bandung Conference of 1955 is extraordinarily important. It happened close by, it's just, uh, well, it's more than to our journey because one has to, it's easier to go by train, I suppose, uh, now that they've got this wonderful um, rail system in place. Um, and the Asian Society of International Law held its conference in Bandung last year. And this was the first time that personalities, the statesmen of Asia and Africa, met together to say, what is our vision of the world? What is our version of international law? We need to articulate that and we need to reform the system of international law that had been created by the West and which was a system that really continued to further Western interests. So on one hand, you could say there was decolonization and decolonization brought an end to the whole process of colonialism. But these uh, statesmen understood that colonialism simply took on new forms and um, and uh, the term neocolonialism was used to un try and understand these new versions of colonialism. So the great uh, uh, African statesman Nkrumah came up with the term neocolonialism to describe a situation where colonialism continues, mainly economic colonialism, but sometimes colonialism in a way through violence, at a time when colonialism was supposed to have officially ended. So this, uh, uh, in a way, brings me towards the end of uh, what I was uh, going to say here. Uh, let me just check my notes, because um, what I want to make uh, clear here is that it is often said that tw twail or third world approaches is simply critical. It simply attacks Western international law without providing alternatives. But that is to ignore history. It is a, to ignore what was said in Bandung and the Bandung communique. It is to ignore the huge effort made by developing countries to establish what they called a new international economic order. Now, that was not successful, but it was an extraordinary campaign which led to the passage of multiple very important resolutions and alternative visions of trade and investment. The developing countries did not want to say, we have to stop all trade, we have to stop all investment, not at all. They wanted trade and investment, but trade and investment as part of a regime that was more sympathetic to the needs of the peoples of the third world. So I simply want to say that there are these extraordinary campaigns, these very important instruments that have been passed, but again, in the conventional history, conventional history of international law, they don't feature very much. It is largely, I would say, because of the efforts of 12 scholars in more recent years that we are now revisiting those initiatives to see what might be learned from them. But here I simply want to say is that there were many alternatives presented. But those alternatives failed basically because, of course, the Western countries, the rich countries, were not particularly, particularly sympathetic to those alternatives and the type of redistributive international law that those alternatives were trying to put in place. Now a question we can now ask is, surely the first world, third world, north, south, rich, poor division is too simple. And yes, it is too simple. <laughs> because we can look at issues and say it's much more complicated than that. This country which is supposed to be a poor country is actually a very rich country, Singapore. <laughs> I don't know whether Singapore would consider itself to be north or south, but I believe that Singapore claims to have developing country status as far as economic relations are concerned. I won't ask anyone from AGC uh, here to actually confirm or deny, but it's interesting how you know, Singapore could be positioned. Is it the north or the south? Or as uh, Lee Kuan Yew said, you know, has Singapore made the journey from third world to first? So there's that possibility as well. But what I would like to suggest is that at a very crude level, all the major negotiations taking place now have a north-south dimension, whether it is in relation to trade, whether it was 
the divisions that were found in the negotiation of the WTO. There was certainly a north-south division, and the south lost. If we look at environmental law, environmental development, there is a north-south uh, dimension, which is very powerful, even though it's difficult to place countries like Saudi Arabia in that spectrum. But the whole question of loss and damage, which is so crucial in environmental negotiations, has that north-south dimension, as it were. So we can see that these divisions continue on in different ways. Even the current uh, conflict between Israel and Palestine, there are north-south dimensions there if we see the voting patterns in the General Assembly um, in that regard. Uh, we can see in the structures of the World Bank, for example, that institutionalized in the structure of the World Bank is a north-south dimension because basically the World Bank tries to reconstruct countries in the south. The basic argument is you are poor because of problems that are to be found in your own country. Fix them. But developing country scholars would say, yes, we have suffered tyrants, corruption, all that is absolutely true. And Twale scholars are very critical of the corruption and tyranny that third world governments exercise on their people. But it is also true that colonialism and the economic relations created out of colonialism place these countries in a disadvantaged position. And if we are to change and bring economic justice to many countries, what is needed is a reconstruction that involves all countries, the, the broader structures, not just focusing on the developing world itself. But can we see how institutionally that the north-south division is continued in, the, in this way? So um, let me finally conclude, finally, finally, um, by saying that we call ourselves third world approaches to international law. Many of us are from the third world. But I see, for my part, I see TWAIL as a cosmopolitan project. In other words, this goes back to what uh, Joseph very kindly said, that TWAIL isn't simply about the third world. <laughs> TWAIL is about everybody. And it is about everybody for a couple of different reasons. So one thing that we can claim is that many of the technologies of inequality and disadvantage that were perfected in relation to the treatment of the South, those technologies are now being used by countries from the South, by powerful countries in the South, uh, against, as it were, countries in the North. So China's emergence has caused a lot of consternation. And we can see a whole jurisprudence about security arising to try and prevent China in various ways acquiring assets in countries like Australia and the United States and so forth. And uh, China is uh, very active in terms of uh, signing bilateral investment treaties. I think that's right, Wen Lan. OK, I can see a nod there. Um, so, um, and we can also see that many of the rich countries themselves are suddenly discovering the disadvantages of investor state, of the investor state system. So we have a situation, for example, in a recent uh, case in Italy, where the Italian government passed uh, regulations, environmental regulations, designed to protect the environment, and a company that had uh, mining rights or whatever it is in relation to that area sued the Italian government, saying that these environmental protections are going to actually undermine our profits and violate the standards of fair and equitable, no, I, I can't remember the details of the case, but that was, uh, it was within the context of investor state dispute settlement. And the investor won. So this is the rock hopper case for those of you who might be familiar with this whole question. So it is furthermore, so we can see then that these technologies create inequality, not just in the North, but also, not just in the South, I'm sorry, but also in the North. And inequality is a growing problem in the North as well. And environmental issues are so significant in this regard. So this is why I say TWAIL is a co cosmopolitan project, because many friends, allies, Western scholars are also now concerned about those issues. And my hope is that they find TWAIL techniques, TWAIL principles, TWAIL forms of analysis helpful
to achieving this broader goal of establishing some kind of international justice. You've been very patient. Thank you so much. Thank you.